guys, Karen's going to turn on the lights. Well, welcome. Thanks for being here today. We can tell that uh, spring break started. We're missing a few folks that are that are in the educational field, so I think that they are out enjoying their week off. Now, if you remember a year ago when they took off, they didn't come back. So we're going back this time. We're going back this time. Coming from the teacher in the front row, we are going back this time. Well, welcome to Transformation Church. We're glad you joined us today. For those of you that are new, we hope we can say welcome home. We want to be a place for you to come to, to understand scripture in a loving way through Christ. You know, I think that here at Transformation, we've got some announcements today. Let's go ahead and run through those. Rebecca, go ahead and uh, let's see. Uh, giving made easy. We always said it before. We have a, an offering um, uh, basket, if you will, by the front door. But we have other ways for you to give as well. Uh, you can find transformation.com. Are you forwarding those? Nope, going that by was all it. Okay, we also have a ministry app. See, we just didn't think it was going to be that way. I can go back. Uh, so you can download your app. No, you're good. You can download the app if you like to. Freedom class started last Wednesday. We still have room. Uh, if you missed the first couple, that's fine. I think up to the week four um, is kind of hard to, to join back again. But if you'd like to, we have it uh, next um, Wednesday night at our house, six o'clock. And it'll be from six to eight. We also have a way to pray for you. So if in the middle of the week you're in need of prayer or something and you can't get in touch with me, you can text your prayer request to 830-293-4483 and we'll be able to uh, answer your prayer. And transformation tracks, today is track two. So if you missed track one last week, you can do that again next month. Track two is today. This is where you get to find your design. We figure out exactly what it is that makes you tick and then what your spiritual gifts are as well. And as you combine those two, you can get a much wholer life in Christ. Let's see, uh, Karen, is there anything I forgot? Does that look about right? All right. Well, with that, uh, if you would, let's bow in prayer and then we'll get this service started today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to live a life worthy of your calling. Lord, I thank you for this auditorium and allowing us to be here today, Lord. I thank for thankful for those that are here today to hear your word. Let whatever comes from my mouth clear your throne room first today, Lord. And as we bless those that hear this word today, let your Holy Spirit come upon them. Let, let your Holy Spirit enlighten them on where they need to be in their lives, Father God. We thank you for that. We thank you for Kerrville. And as we pray for Kerrville and Kirk County and all the surrounding areas, Lord Jesus, I just ask your blessing upon it all. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray this. Amen and amen. All right, so this preacher tells his congregation that next week I'm going to be teaching a sermon on Mark 17. And I want you to go home and I want you to read Mark 17. And then when we come back next week, we'll talk about it. So he sent them all out and the next Sunday it comes around and they all come back and he says, okay, who read Mark 17? And everyone's hand in the auditorium rose. And he said, great. Mark only has 16 chapters. I'll now preach online. <laughs> So our scripture today, we're going to continue with bad religion when good Christianity goes wrong. This is week two. If you missed last week, you can go online and see it. It's on. It's it's there. But this week, we're going to be focusing a little bit on Jeremiah 23, 9 through 40. I know it's a lot of text, but please, if you have a Bible, you can look it up in there. Uh, and I'm going to read this to you, and then we'll break down the scriptures and talk about them. Concerning the prophets... My heart is broken within me. All my bones treble. I am like a drunken man, like a strong man, overcome by wine because of the Lord and his holy words. The land is full of adulterers because of the curse. The land lies parched and the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless, even in my temple. I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and there they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year they are punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. 
Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water, because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind spiraling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets say, who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another, words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues. <clears throat> and yet declare, the Lord declares, indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They will tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not spend, send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. When these people or a prophet or a priest ask you, what is the message from the Lord? Say to them, what message? I will forsake you, declares the Lord. If a prophet or a priest or anyone else claims this is a message from the Lord, I will punish them and their household. This is what each of you keeps saying to your friends and other Israelites. What is the Lord's answer or what has the Lord spoken? But you must not mention a message from the Lord again, because each one's word becomes their own message. So you distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty, our God. This is what you keep saying to a prophet. What is the Lord's answer to you? Or what has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is a message from the Lord, this is what the Lord says. You use the words, this is a message from the Lord, even though I told you that you must not claim this is a message from the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you and cast you out of my presence, along with the city I gave you and your ancestors. I will bring you everlasting disgrace everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. Okay, so Jeremiah, the writer of this, he was a lone, tr truthful voice in a sea of hypocrites and liars. God rightfully judges the false teachers. God does not tolerate lying or hypocrisy, especially when it's done in his name. The believer should embrace truth even, in a diff even if it's difficult to hear, instead of searching the voices that will tell them what they want to hear. So the three things I want you to take away from today is that God talks to those he chooses. God speaks. Man lies. But God forgives. So let's break down the scriptures. On verses 9, in, uh, verses nine and 10, this passage that here, Jeremiah is shaken by the evil, 
that the prophets and the judgment of God is about to pronounce upon them. See, earlier in chapter 14, verse 13, Jeremiah said to God, but I said, alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling me you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you everlasting peace in this place. Basically, he was telling them that all was well. That will have, they won't have any kind of troubles. And how many of us don't want troubles in our lives? Right? They will not have troubles of any kind. This was the exact opposite of what God had told Jeremiah. See, these prophets were saying, everything's easy, everything's great. Jeremiah was saying, God says, you will have troubles. For years now, Jeremiah had heard the lying oracles of the false prophets. He has watched them deceive the masses with their empty words of comfort and assurance. He has witnessed the hypocrisy and sin of their lives and has seen the corruption fill the land. Now he's had a fresh encounter with God and he received a word of judgment against all of the false prophets. All of this overwhelmingly, he is utterly staggered by what he hears because God's anger is burning, especially hot against the false prophets. Because in speaking lies in his name, they misrepresent the Lord himself. Have we seen any of that today? I think we have. Verses 11 through 17. If we look at this in verse 11, the voice now shift, it shifts to God's, to God's voice, not Jeremiah's. As he denounces both the prophets and the priests, the religious establishment was evil, practicing wickedness, not just in their private lives, but in the house of God as well. Verse 12 shows that God will allow them to walk and fall on that slippery path. In verse 13 through 15, the northern and southern kingdoms were both guilty of causing the people to stray. See, the Sumerians prophesied wrongly by Baal, but the prophets of Jerusalem were even worse. They prophesied falsely in the Lord's name. They were rotten, and they were dragging the rest of the nation into wrongdoing. God will judge them severely. Verse 16 and 17 shows us that Jeremiah, again, was the lone, honest voice in a sea of deception. He became tasked with telling the people not to listen to those other guys. But there are two things that the false prophets of Israel did. And I want you to see them through the verses. The first thing they did is they taught people to sin by their examples. Last week we talked about are we walking the walk and talking the talk. These people were walking the wrong walk and they were convincing others to follow in their examples. He compares them with the prophets of Samaria, the head city of the kingdom of the ten tribes, which has been long since laid to waste. It was the folly of the prophets of Samaria that they prophesied in Baal's name. So Ahab's prophets did, and so they caused many people in Israel to err, to follow Baal, for the for forsaking the service of the true God and worshiping Baal. The second thing is, they encouraged people to sin by their false prophecies. They made themselves believe that there was no harm, no danger, no sin, and they practiced it accordingly. And because of this, they made others believe so too. Hindsight would show them later how right God was in his judgment and how wrong the false prophets were. They should have been preaching a message of repentance, not a message of falsehood. A message to return to God instead of telling people what they wanted to hear. Is that the message we hear today? Beauty, ease, peace. We're not talking of sin. And we should be. Verses 18 
through 32. It's a, it's a long, drawn-out part of this. But it's dealing with the blatant hypocrisy and wickedness that could not be hidden from, hidden from God, who sees everything. There's nothing you or I can do in secret that he does not see. Verses 23 through 24 show that they manufactured dreams and they stole one another's revelations. Kind of like the paparazzi who tried to get the better picture for some gossip magazine. Who can tell the greatest lie? That's what they did. Looking at verses 25 through 32, we see that God was sick of them saying that they had a burdensome or heavy message from the Lord. When in fact, they didn't have a message from God at all. What they had was their own mind making things up. It diluted the true message that God was trying to speak to the people through Jeremiah. And because of their flippancy, their generation, or this generation, I should say, of prophets, would be remembered as false. See, God does not tolerate lying and hypocrisy, especially when it's done in his name. Charles Spurgeon, who was called the Prince of Preachers, had this to say about this very thing. If any of you are in the habit of hearing sermons which are very fine, very elegant, very logical, very proper, yet if they never strike you as the hammer strikes the rock, if they never aim at breaking your hearts, do not waste any more Sundays in hearing them. For they are not God's word. This word is a hammering word. And if the preacher's message does not smite you, if it does not ultimately break you in pieces, it is because it is not the word of God to which you have been listening. This is the test which God himself gives here to distinguish true from false prophets. He goes on saying, now put the two together, the fire and the hammer, and you will see how God makes his servants who are to be instruments for his use. He puts us into the fire of the word. He melts and softens. He subdues. Then he takes us out of the fire and wields us with the hammer, such as only he can give. Till he has made us fit instruments for his use. And he goes forth on the sacred work of conquering the multitudes, having in his hands the polished shafts that he has forged with the fire and the hammer of his word. God tells us that in the verses. Does he not say that I will bring fire and use the hammer? That's what he does. Verses 33 through 40 ends this passage like this. Through this passage so far, we have studied, what we've studied is very scathing to people who are listening to this. And it's important to remember that the book of Jeremiah is a book not only of judgment, but of hope. In the first passage of chapter 23, God stands in judgment of the bad shepherds, but he also offers a hopeful glimpse of a time when there will be godly shepherds who care for their flock. When the faithful, united remnant of God's people are brought together out of exile and when a righteous king rules, that coming king we know and was Jesus Christ. This remains our enduring hope. Whether we have suffered under the lies of hypocrisy or of a lying prophet or have benefited from the care of a caring earthly shepherd. Ultimately, our faith is not in our religious leaders. I've said that to you before. Don't put me on this standard because I'm man and man will let you down every time. Number two, man lies. Remember? We try not to. We really do. But we are all flesh and blood. 
And if you hold, as this says, a leader in this never make a mistake thing, you'll walk away from the church when they do wrong because you think it's hypocrisy. When in fact it's not, it's human nature. And that's where repentance comes in for each and every one of us. Again, faith is not in our religious leaders, their strengths or their weaknesses. But it is Jesus, the head of the church, where we should put all of our strength. Often we think of bad religion as the moral failings of religious leaders. We see them fall to greed, lust, ego, being destroyed by sin and preaching against it in the pulpit. The very thing they preach against, they are doing. That's hypocrisy. Another common tell of bad religion is a focus on judging others, pointing to their sins, their mistakes, and not embracing your own. It's also falling for legalism and being graceless in doing so. If we offered grace and not judgment, what would that do for God's work? Do amazing things. Here, Scripture challenges us to understand that bad religion sometimes means ignoring a key component of the gospel message so we can tell people what they want to hear. It's not all bad roses. Life happens. We will all face challenges. When we mess up, there are consequences. Amen. God is still in control. Do you trust him? We sin. We need to be held accountable. God's message of repentance and turning back to him is as relevant today as it was in the book of Jeremiah. Telling people what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear is not limited to the Old Testament prophets. Pastors and leaders are often faced with the reality today that sharing the message of God has given them through his word might also ruffle some feathers. The congregations get mad, the emails start to flow, Funding from significant financial donors dries up. Even people leaving the churches or firing the pastors because they preached God's word. I have a friend in town who pastors a really large church. And when he moved here, he chose to pastor the way he always pastored. He wears shorts sometimes. Jeans, flip-flops, shirts untucked. And the scathing emails that he shared with me from his congregation. And he would talk about those emails from the pulpit, not calling out the person who sent it. But just say, here's what I'm going to wear next week. And he would. See, we look at what goes on up here and have this mindset. Listen to the message. When you're in... A service and you focus on a crying baby who believe me I think kids should be in service but you focus on the crying baby you're not focused on the message we let these outside distractions get to us focus on the message there's something there for each and every one of us avoiding the truth is a typical human response have you ever told your friend a lie in order to avoid revealing your true feelings? Oh, I love the hair color, right? You see, you see this? <laughs> we all do it because we don't want to face the truth. I think that if more of us spoke in truth through love, we could change the world. Perhaps you want to avoid your own truths. There's something going on in your life you don't want to face. During my research on the study this week, I found that there's a, a, a band. I've never heard of them before. Their name is Train. Has anybody heard of Train? Okay, well, there's a band named Train. And they have a song that's called 50 Ways to Say Goodbye. 
Now I watched the video of this, and what it is is the main character is asked in the grocery store where his girlfriend is. The guy who asked him says, you're always together. Where is she? What's going on? Well, instead of telling the person that he got dumped, because it would have been embarrassing, he wouldn't know what to do, he made up all these outlandish stories about his ex-girlfriend's death just to save face. He said that she went down in an airplane. She got fried in a suntan booth. She fell into a cement mixer full of quicksand. She met a shark underwater, fell and no one caught her, got eaten by a lion, drowned in the hot tub, danced to death at a nightclub. All these stories because he didn't want to say what happened. He took the easy way out instead of telling the truth. Telling the truth is the easiest thing to do because you don't have to remember the lie you told. We try to teach our girls that all the time. Just tell the truth. Lying is hard, folks. It's a lot harder than you think. I won't call her out, you see, I won't. Taking the easy way out is, is usually only a short-term solution for what your problem that you're facing. You see, at the end of the video, while he was explaining all this to the man in song, his ex-girlfriend walked up. Now what? The truth comes out. No matter how big your lie or how small your lie, the truth will always be revealed. In our personal relationships, we have a difficult message to bring and our own hypocrisy to contend with. We all have friends, family, and other loved ones who are living outside of God's plan and purposes for their lives. See, the gospel starts with a hard truth. We are all sinners and we need God. While we don't need to evangelize in the streets with fire and brimstone tactics, we can humbly and kindly try to reach others and help them see a different path for their lives. A different perspective, if you will. And real hope. This means living faithfully, vulnerably admitting our own failings and offering God's grace and hope to those who are convicted by the Holy Spirit and turn to the Lord. Remember, God, there is no condemnation in Christ. But if the Holy Spirit's in your life, you will feel conviction. And that's what causes repentance. That's what causes us to turn from our wicked ways. It also look, means looking squarely at our own individual and group biases that we have, our rebellion, and our need for repentance. Instead of running from God, run back to God. Instead of saying, I'm not going to do anything with this group because they think differently than me, try to embrace what they do in a Christian, loving, God-filled way. The Holy Spirit is trying to intervene in somebody else's life, and you may be that vessel that brings that to fruition. It's easy to see someone else's need for God and call repentance while ignoring our own. We might think as the false prophets likely rationalized, yes, some of our people are sinful, but look at all the pagans around us. They don't even worship God, do they? And they practice the grossest of sins. By comparison, we're good people, and surely God will take that into account. Our sins aren't acceptable, but our sins are acceptable, but theirs, they're not. Really? Think about that. Besides, who wants to hear judgment preached all the time? Just preach on the love of God. We're so quick to forget that Jeremiah was talking to the Israelites. These were God's chosen people. They weren't the pagans of this day. So let's talk just for a moment on prophecy today. There are absolutely no legitimate examples in the Bible of a true prophet of God making any prophetic mistakes or near misses even. A prophet was the, was the direct voice of God to the people who alone is omniscient and can look into the future. 
See, the Bible makes it clear that when the prophet of both the Old Testament and the New Testament received a word from God, it was perfect and free from error. The supernatural gifts are still available today from Jesus. He's the giver of the gifts. Just as they were in the first century, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. There was no changing of the rules when Jesus came along. There are no mulligans to the ministry when speaking of prophetic words as a direct oracle from God. An oracle meaning God said it. In the words, If the words of a prophet are not perfect and are not free from error, God has some rather harsh words for them. We heard about them in Jeremiah. The supernatural gift of prophecy is speaking confidently without any error or inaccuracy to strengthen and comfort others. It is speaking a message of divine encouragement from the heart of God that touches a person's innermost being. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says it like this out of the NIV. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. I want to look at this now in the message. But when you proclaim his truth in everyday speech, you're letting others in on the truth so that they can grow and be strong and experience his presence with you. Do you do that? Do you encourage others in the Lord? The only absolutely reliable source to know and hear God's voice is his written word to us, the Bible, which is why we as Christians are to diligently read his word. I leave you with this today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Amen. I'd like to give you an opportunity at this time